Welcome everyone. My name is Sonal Shah and um, my, I am a professor at Georgetown University and the president of the Asian American Foundation. I have led social impact efforts in academia, government, and the private and philanthropic sectors for over 25 years. Most re recently, we started I'm the founding president of the Asian American Foundation, uh, which was started after all of the anti-hate incidents against Asian Americans in the last year, and really focused on uh, creating a space for belonging and prosperity amongst Asian Americans, free from discrimination, violence, and fear. Um, and as I said, I'm also a professor at Georgetown University. And my experience in the public and private sectors, I started off in, in the international side where I worked at the Department of Treasury, uh, Google.org and Goldman Sachs, and then really moved to the domestic side as I joined the White House under the Obama administration as deputy assistant to President Obama and director of the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. Uh, recently, I served as uh, the National Policy Director for Mayor Pete Buttigieg's presidential campaign and sit on the boards of Oxfam America, the UBS Optimist Foundation, and the Century Foundation. Um, so I am super excited to be here today to do this book talk featuring my friend and someone who I just really admire, Fatima Sumar, sponsored by the Truman National Security Project. It is a pleasure to see so many people from many parts of the country join us for a discussion that I hope will help illuminate the growing intersection between national security and international development. Too often we talk about these two things as if they're one or the other. And what this book serves to provide and what I think Fatima serves to provide us is really understanding how this comes together. And it's important that when we think about the future, the development and diplomacy come together. So, uh, you know, I think this is one of the must reads for anyone that's going into national security or development because I think you need both sides of this. So uh, that's why I'm super excited to be here. Um, Truman National Security Project is a high impact, high trust impact community for national security leaders. You all are leading in so many different places. Uh, they develop timely, innovative, principled solutions to preserve and expand democracy, human rights, prosperity, and security around the world. No greater time for everything that the Truman National Security Project do does than today as we look around the world. The diverse membership includes Hill staff, federal employees, nonprofit leaders, academics, industry leaders, political strategists, and elected officials across federal, state, and local governments. Again, it is my true pleasure and honor to introduce this discussion today with Fatima Sumar, author of The Development Diplomat, working across borders, boardrooms, and bureaucracies to end poverty. She is a member of Truman's class of 2009. She's a mission-oriented change leader and author spearheading efforts to advance sustainable and inclusive development to vulnerable populations and reduce global poverty. Fatima is currently the Vice President of Compact Operations at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which we will talk more about, an innovative and independent US Foreign Assistance Agency. She served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asia at the Department of State and as a president, Presidential Management uh, Fellow. She's also worked for three US senators, including a senior professional staff for the US uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee focused on Afghanistan, Pakistan and the broader region. She's worked at, in civil society at Oxfam America and the American Civil Liberties Union and con continues to sit on advisory boards of Princeton, Cornell and Indiana universities. Her work has been published in the Stanford Innovation Review, The New Republic, The Hill and other outlets. She's a frequent guest speaker and has testified before the House of Representatives and the US Senate. So as, you, as we talk about the development diplomat, it is her debut book, which I hope there are many more coming. For those of you that haven't read it, I urge you to read it. It is an easy read. She makes complicated issues easy to understand and really think through and, and, and delves into some ideas and implications for everyone today, anyone thinking about going into development or diplomacy, um, or hopefully both. So Fatima, I just gave a very highlighted version of your bio and who you are. 
Um, I'm grateful for the Truman National Security Project for hosting this event, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you got started. We had such a great conversation about this of like where you started in your career and how you got to really believing this idea of development diplomacy. Great. Well, so thank you so much. It's so great to be with you again and with the Truman family. I want to just give first a huge shout out to the Truman National Security Project. I'm such a long and proud member of Truman and really believe in Truman's power and potential to connect all of us across our lanes and make it a collective whole. And I really wanna give a shout out to Ginny Ahn who's worked uh, so hard with us to pull this incredible event together. So my huge appreciation to the entire Truman family, the Truman Cons team and Ginny. And, and Sonal, you know, getting back to your question, you know, I was, I was reflecting a little bit and as I came back to talk to Truman, when I joined Truman back in the day in 2009, I was squarely, squarely in the foreign policy, national security lanes. I mean, that is what I studied in undergraduate, my undergraduate degree, my graduate degree. I'm really embarrassed to say this, but you know, I graduated with two fancy degrees and never took an international development class, right? Uh, mostly because I didn't have to, so I didn't. And I stayed in like a really hardcore foreign policy IR security lane. And that's what I both studied. That's where I did my internships. Um, coming as a PMF, a presidential management fellow, I got a job at the State Department focused largely you know, on Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the war. And it really was a wartime footing for the United States post 9-11 as we were engaged both in Iraq and Afghanistan. And this was the height, really, of, of, of you know, um, the U.S. wartime footing in the Middle East and South Central Asia. And so that's really where I focused my career. And I thought, you know, well, I want to have impact on the world. I want to do it as a very proud public official of the U.S. government. And I'm going to do that through serving the State Department on the foreign policy side. So that's where I made my bet, uh, so to speak. And um, it wasn't until I started, you know, actually exploring well, what does foreign policy actually, who, how do we decide what the parameters are of foreign policy, who funds it, who agrees with it, who, you know, who are the, who are the oversight authorities around it um, that led me to Capitol Hill, where all answers ultimately, I used to joke, there's two ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, and if you want to be successful in Washington, we all work in different buildings along Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Avenue, but ultimately you have to understand the White House and you have to understand Congress. And uh, one of the best pieces of advice I got from one of my professors was, if you wanna be serious about foreign policy and national security, go to the Hill. And so I went to the Hill both as a fellow uh, working for Senator Casey, but then landed and the book describes in chapter three how I got some of these jobs because I don't think we're always very transparent about what it takes to get some of these jobs, how I landed a job um, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee working for the incoming chairman at the time, Senator Kerry. And you know, overnight I went from having this oversight portfolio of Afghanistan and Pakistan in the broader region to not just a wartime of like, what, is, what are we doing in terms of the, the wartime strategy or foreign policy, but I inherited oversight of $6 billion worth of our aid dollars to Afghanistan and Pakistan. And um, really this huge responsibility, I think it was 28 at the time, and this huge responsibility for understanding if taxpayer dollars, $6 billion worth, were being spent well in the region. And I think it was a real wake up. And call. that's annually, right? That's that so annual. That annually. That's fiscal year 2009. Yeah. I remember that because yeah. that was the supplemental that came through with a $4.1 billion request. And I, I remember this moment of sobriety where I felt like I've been training my entire career for this moment and I've got to retrain immediately on the job to figure out how I'm going to do it. And I think that was my wake up moment when I realized that the artificial divides that separate us very early in our training grounds, whether that's high school, college, graduate school, FSI, et cetera, you know, actually create these artificial silos that don't actually work when we think about the people that we're serving. Yeah, and Fatima, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, today I talk to a lot of uh, a lot of folks and they want to work either in national security or on the White House side. But the Hill piece is, is super important. It's important. You mention it quite often in your book. You talk about how it trains you. Would you mind just delving a little bit into why that 
why when you worked on the Hill, that really shaped you? Sure. So for all of you that have worked in the executive branch in the U.S. government, you'll be really familiar, whether you're at DOD, the Defense Department, or the State Department, or Treasury, or any of our U.S. federal agencies, you're part of a big bureaucracy, right? So you've had this experience, right, working at different parts of the executive branch. You know, when I was at the State Department, the State Department's a 70,000-person bureaucracy, right? So you could be a desk officer, an office director, wherever you are in the bureaucracy, but ultimately you're one of dozens or not hundreds or thousands of people that has eyes on policy, either for your technical lane or your geographic lane, right? Now, when you go to the Hill, and I was on one of the congressional committees, and I, I, spend, I do spend a lot of time in the book. The book is really a how-to guide for, for many people who have international careers because they may know their piece of it, but they often don't understand the other piece. So even on the congressional side, it really kind of lays out the role of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, its sister committee in the House, the difference between congressional committees and personal offices. And on the congressional committee side, you have two oversight committees. I happen, I had the, I had the honor of serving on, on, on the Senate side, SFRC. And when you're in that role, you go automatically from being one of dozens and hundreds and thousands of people responsible for policy to one of one or two or three people that have to f give both the analysis and the advice to your member of what to do. And so the bench is like one or two or three deep and that's it, not hundreds deep where there's many people checking your talking point and clearing your talking point. And a lot of people on the Hill can be actually quite young as I was in this role. I was in my late twenties. And I remember this huge sense of responsibility on my shoulders to advise then Senator Kerry, who was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of what our posture should be vis-a-vis -vis the US war in Afghanistan and our posture in neighboring Pakistan. And I think in order to understand that, you had to understand not just the State Department, not just DOD, not just where the White House was at. You had to understand the budgets with OMB, what were OMB's postures as you received congressional notifications and budgets, USAID, and any other, other major actors and donors in that space beyond the US government as well. And I think it's, it's all the roads you know, kind of meet there on the Hill in many ways. And, you're, and your job as a staffer is to sort through all of that and ultimately figure out, are we doing the right thing? Yeah, I mean, that's incredible responsibility, but it's also an incredible uh, empowerment mechanism, right? Where you sort of learn very quickly on the job. I know you write in the book and you've said this, uh, you even said this in your intro, it's like you learned quickly, right? You're a national security person who learned about development. Um, so let's delve a little bit into this development side and what you learned along the way and why why you are talking about development diplomacy. Why, does, why do these two things matter? Great. So, so I love that you and I are having this conversation because I actually think we came from different ends of the spectrum. Yes. And today in our careers, we're both kind of here, but you know, I started out over here and I think you started out over here, if I'm remembering correctly. I started on the development side. Right. And I started on the foreign policy side. And I think what we both realized over the over different jobs, and you and I have had many different jobs over the lifespan of our careers and still going, is that these artificial divides sometimes that separate us, if you, if you say you're a development person and you're over here, or you're the national security defense foreign policy person and you're over here, well, in fact, at the end of the day, what you're really responsible for is, let's say, in the bilateral context, US policy towards country X. That's what you're ultimately responsible for delivering to your principles, going all the way up, in your case, to the president, right, of the United States. Right. The principle does not actually care that it's this line or this line or your expertise is here or here or here. The principal right. has to understand the entire spectrum of options and then decide what is in the best interest of, in this case, for what the jobs you and I have been in, US foreign policy, right? Yeah. Towards country X. Oftentimes when we think about diplomacy, you know, there's lots of different types. So the book talks about there's vaccine diplomacy today. We're all familiar with that. There's nuclear diplomacy, science diplomacy. There's lots of different types. But at least for my career, I've never really felt like we've had an intentional conversation around development diplomacy. And this idea 
that if we're going to solve poverty at scale, at scale, so in a transformative way through our policies, let's say in this case at a national federal level overseas, and we're going to hit the sustainable development goals, which we signed up for to end poverty once and for all by 2030, that we actually need to work across these silos, across these divides in a kind of a really transformative, different way of thinking and understand that if you're sitting over here, you can't do it alone. You need to leverage the power of the foreign policy community who often does not understand what you are doing. And vice versa, the community over here on the development side may often not really appreciate or not wanna politicize the work that they're doing. And so oftentimes the incentive structures we have in place are to put our heads down, each do our own thing and not find enough ways to work strategically together starting sometimes because we don't even understand what the other is actually doing um, or, right. or their own philosophies or their own approaches. Um, in the book, there is actually a Venn diagram. It's on page 63 for any of you that are following along. And I actually chart out in this Venn diagram, what are the incentives to fight poverty if you're sitting in the foreign policy side versus the development side? And at first glance, when I wrote the book, I thought the Venn diagram, the overlap would be really big would be really big because who doesn't want to fight poverty, right? Wherever you sit on the spectrum, that sounds right. But in fact, the incentive structures are not actually aligned organically to make that intersection uh, as large as it could be. It's actually quite small. It's quite small. And I think that's our challenge. And that's why you're seeing today in the world some of the highest rates of poverty. In the year 2020, Sonal, as you know well, the global community undid 25 years of progress, fighting poverty, extreme poverty. We undid 25 years of progress in 25 weeks, which speaks to the fragility of the global infrastructure and the systems we have. And it speaks to the fact that you can't care about foreign policy. You can't care about defense policy. You can't care about security if you, can, if you, if you can't appreciate or advocate for people's lives and the security of their lives. And that's where the development conversation is so important. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I learned it in Sarajevo. I went to go live in Sarajevo after the US had finished bombing. And I was the one lone econ person that went. There, was, there were other development agencies that came, but it was really to think about how to build an economy there, but you had to get the politics right too. So it was interesting, like I learned on the ground very quickly how we live in our silos. And I know you've seen that, you know, from where you've been. Let's delve into the poverty piece because you talk a lot about poverty at scale and transformation in the book, but also just your experiences. So Afghanistan is a big place where you've had a lot of experience. Would you mind talking a little bit about what you learned in Afghanistan and what were some of the key lessons there? Yeah, there was this huge, you know, if you go back to the 2000s in the height of the post 9-11 posture that both administrations had, starting with the Bush administration and then the Obama administration, you know, there was this real sense that as we scaled up a wartime footing, first in Afghanistan, and then you saw the same thing replicate in Iraq, for instance, and then Syria down the line, that the way we would do that is not just with troops, we would certainly search troops, and you saw that happen, but we would also surge development dollars in, into these countries. And if we went to Congress you know, and, and asked for more money, and we had a lot of these supplementals at the time, if you'll remember, where we requested additional money every fiscal year for, for, for the wars, um, including on the development side. And so you had a point where at the height of fiscal 2009, I think USAID received $4.1 billion for Afghanistan alone, for Afghanistan alone, which just to put that in comparison, could be like the sum of all of its um, investments everywhere else in the world, right? Um, for similar for similar budget lines. So you're talking about huge amounts of money that Congress is 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 appropriating to to countries like Afghanistan, and there was such a political imperative, if you'll remember, at the time, to get the money out the door as fast as possible, right? And if we could run the money through the Karzai government, if we could run the money and just get it out the door at the local levels, the provincial levels. Remember these provincial reconstruction teams that were set up with representatives from USAID, defense, state, and a, a, have a kind of one team approach and one government approach to how we did this. 
if we could get money into the hands of farmers, for instance, to dig canals, we'd get them out of the opium, you know, out of the poppy fields, for instance, remember? Um, so there was this, there's this huge kind of like ticking time bomb of let's go, let's move fast, let's get as much money as fast as possible. And I think a lot of the work I started doing on the Hill was to, because I myself was trying to actually for myself understand the money and was the money being spent well, I ended up inadvertently actually in some ways over two years doing my own investigation of the money, the money trail. And through, I read, I think I may have been the only person in all of Washington, I wanted to test that at one point. I think I read every single Congressional Research Service report, GAO report, Inspector General report, every single audit that went out of the money trail, um, every congressional notification with follow-up briefings and hearings that I'm sure the administration loved me for at the time, which can be quite irritating. Um, we had over 40 hearings that we organized that I was part of on SFRC, on Afghanistan and Pakistan alone, to, to understand how we were spending the money in the broader strategy. Um, multiple trips to the region, and the book talks about what some of those trips are actually like and what, what from, a, from a staffer's point of view, what actually takes place on some of this type of high stakes political and congressional travel. Um, without knowing it, I spent two years investigating the money and how the money was being spent. And remember, this is a Democratic Senate at the time with the Democratic House, with the Democratic White House. And so when, the, when, when, when I started putting the findings together and I was actually on maternity leave with my second when this happened and I sleepless and all these thoughts were percolating. And I remember one night in the middle of the night, I got up, turned on my computer and even though I wasn't technically working, it all kind of clicked for me that our policy was the wrong policy and that we were not spending the development dollars right and that that was having huge implications of our foreign policy strategy. And I you know, had written many reports during my time on SFRC, but this was probably the one that was the most controversial, probably the, most, the highest profile report. And the one that took, you know, was based off a two-year investigation and then months and months politically to work it through the system. And um, you know, we had a lot of conversations and I really credit then Senator Kerry because he took a lot of political courage at the time to publish the findings of the report. And it was actually, if you can see, I don't know if you can see it here, but it's, it's framed up here. It was the front page of the Washington Post story, basically critiquing how then the Obama administration was spending money in Afghanistan and that it was not sustainable, that the strategy was not sustainable. And that really came out of this lens of this development investigation, but had huge implications of our foreign policy and national security strategy. Um, and it's something, and those lessons, I think I still carry with me very much today, even outside of a wartime footing, as we think about the right development and foreign policy footprint. Yeah, and, and so before I ask the next question, just to remind everyone, put your questions in Q&A. Uh, we will be, uh, I will be at taking your questions and asking Fatima because I could keep going on this for a long time. Um, no matter how much I read her book or talk to her, I feel like I'm always learning every time I talk to her. So please put your questions in and we will try to get them answered. So Fatima, talk a little bit about sort of where you are at MCC. So you've been in the Hill, you went to the State Department, and now you're at a development agency called the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Why there? You know, what have you learned in being there? And and talk also a little bit, if you don't mind, of all the various agencies that come together on development. It's not just USAID or MCC. There's actually many more. So we just love, you know, I think it's important that we talk about how many different people come together when you said you brought all these people together on the ground. What does that mean? Yeah. So I have this cake analogy. So I'll see, let me see if this works here for, for, with you and with this audience. But, you know, I, I think about, Think about cake um, as a generic, C-A-K-E, cake. And I thought a lot about my career. When I was on the Hill, my job was to kind of judge the cake. You know, you know, someone else had put the whole thing together and they'd bring it in front of me. And my job was to kind of say, you know, that was, that was, that's good cake for value. You spent the right amount for, what, for the flavor you got. It looks gorgeous or it looks beautiful or to critique, you know, its design, its cost its flavor, et cetera. But I was kind of the judge of the cake. 
in many ways, that's the oversight role you have when you're on the Hill, especially in key congressional committees like SFRC, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Well, at a certain point, I was interested. It's, it's, it's good to critique. Uh, I, love, I love doing it. It's one of the best jobs in the world. But in some ways, it's kind of easy because you can always find a hole in any strategy, right? And I, you know, I used to ask myself after five years on the Hill, what if I were on the other side of me asking these questions? How would I be able to either answer those questions or what would I do differently to design the policy differently if I were in those shoes? And I was really interested in that. So I moved back to the State Department um, in a senior role as a deputy assistant secretary where I was, I was in charge of regional economic integration across South and Central Asia. And at that time it was taking the Obama administration's vision of a new Silk Road to connect one of the least economically integrated parts of the world with its neighbors. And I was in charge of that. That was, that was what I was in charge of doing. And as I was doing that, I was thinking like my job was like baking the cake at that point, right? In terms of baking the cake, I had to kind of come up with like, was this gonna be a wedding cake or a birthday cake? Was it gonna be cupcakes or a multi-tiered piece? I really had to come up with the policy guidelines for the cake itself, right? And that's what I spent years at the State Department doing with the collective teams. And then at a certain point, I started wondering to myself, so that's good. And I can come up with these directions and directives, but I'm actually wondering like, what if I got my rolled up my sleeves and had to roll the dough and had to go to the grocery store and actually pick out and the ingredients and, fig, and stay within a budget and actually do the work itself? What, what would that look like? And when I had the opportunity to then move over to the Millennium Challenge Corporation, one of, one of our development agencies, I kind of seized on that chance to understand that role of the cake. And so, um, and, 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 and then I stepped away, as you know, for a few years and moved over to civil society, where you also get views on like, what kind of, how many cakes should we be making every week? Who are the cakes supposed to serve? Do the cakes serve a purpose? Are they in the right budget for population, right? And you get all of those views as well. And so I'm, I'm using the cake analogy to kind of break down in a much more simple way that in fact, there's so many different ways we have to look at the same problem set depending on where we sit. And sometimes in our careers, we only end up looking at it from one, from one lens over and over and over. And so we develop those muscles really, really well. But in fact, at the end of the day, it takes all of those roles, whether it's private sector, civil society, government to come together to bake, deliver and, and serve the cake to the people on time, on budget for it to have its intended purpose. And um, I say that because there's often, um, even on the development side, the community that we're talking about is, is, very, is very big and they're not all the same. Not all the actors are the same. So, so people, you're very familiar, most people are very familiar with in the US system, our largest development agency, USAID. But we also have smaller agencies that also punch above their weight in terms of impact like Development Finance Corporation, which was created out of the 2018 Build Act as our premier um, international finance uh, uh, in, in institution from the US government. You have the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which was created by the then Bush administration to reward countries, poor countries that are well governed with grant assistance and economic aid to reduce poverty through sustainable and inclusive economic growth. You have agencies that I love like USTDA, our trade and development agencies, which do critical work to help US companies and others with critical steps, including feasibility studies and feasibility work to actually get projects into a pipeline for the private sector to come in. So we have, we have so many different development agencies, each with their own mission and mandate. And more importantly, each with their own culture. And one of the things the book talks a lot about is the word, when you know, I, I've been pulling a lot of students around the word bureaucracy. In all my university talks before I asked all the students, how many of you wanna be a bureaucrat? Nobody raises their hand, right? Like that is not a sexy word, Sonal, of this generation. I, I have an unscientific test here on this. And yet, in fact, it is the bureaucracies across the board that do shape the culture of options we then can consider. And the bureaucracies can be within an organization, a development agency, um, 
It could be within the federal branch. The bureaucracies could be with our partners, the World Bank, the United Nations, other multilateral spaces, right? And in each of these spaces, we may be very familiar with our own organizational language, culture, and bureaucracy, but oftentimes we're not curious enough to really understand the other. And that breakdown creates artificial silos along the spectrum that actually when you do need to work together on transformative deals to end poverty, make it much more difficult than, than you would expect. Yeah, you know, I, I both love the cake analogy and I love sort of the, the piece about bureaucracy because too often, even, I, even to be fair, even when I sometimes hear it, I wince. And, uh, but it's important because I, I think we tend not to like bureaucracy, but we forget what it was like without the bureaucracy. So what was it like before the UN actually existed? What was it like before the World Bank existed? It's easy to think you don't want the institution the way it is today, but the alternative wasn't a lot better. <laughs> and so part of the reason that all these institutions came together was for those reasons. The question is how do we make the bureaucracy work together? And I think that's one of the pieces of the book that I found super valuable is, is how you did it and the way you went about doing it. But you have a question here from Mike Fox that says, um, how can development practitioners draw on increased attention to public health during the pandemic to elevate development issues as a national security priority um, going forward and prevent the DC dialogue from going back into the norm where it's minimized. And I know you're going through some of this in, 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 in um, Nepal right now, but I know you've seen it in other places. Like, how do we think about this given sort of we are in this pandemic, but how do we make sure that, that, that public health is a part of that? Well, if there's, it's a great question, Mike. And if there was ever a time for all of us to appreciate how much individual, the situation of individual lives, how much they matter of security and what sec that security is not just our traditional guns and butter security, that the way many of us were trained, frankly, to think about security, but security is, is, is global health. Security is cybersecurity. Se security is digital security, financial security, right? That there are so many different ways when we think about what keeps us safe as individuals, as communities, as countries, as nations, as democracies, that security is actually under threat today from, from so many different places. And, and, and the reality is none of those threats respect our geographic borders. And so we have largely an international architecture based on geographic borders driven, you know, drawn up post-World War II with norms and behaviors associated with it. And I think we're all a little perplexed, frankly, Sonal, right now in the world we live in because those norms are not as applicable today for threats that don't care about these, these artificial borders, right? And so you're seeing that even with COVID, for instance, you see Omicron pop up, you see lockdowns take place, but overnight, the virus is all over the place regardless, right? And you can't control it in the same way. So I do think it's a moment. I think it's a moment for the broader development community and all of us that really care about these issues to kind of lean in. And I'm so glad, and I think, and I think President Biden, for instance, even putting a seat at the table in the cabinet, for instance, for USAID, like that is a huge shift of thinking around what national security actually means. And I think more broadly, you know, there is this important opportunity for us to redefine words like security. Um, it's not just if you, you, if you come from a military lens, you work on security. In fact, I would wager most people in the Truman community, whether you work on national security, foreign policy, tech policy, health policy, economic policy, all of that is a form of human security. And in or that is all development actually. It's all development. Now we could choose not to fund it though, right? We could choose to not prioritize it. We could choose to not elevate it and not see the interconnections. Those are policy choices we make or don't make, I think in this moment. So I think we have an opportunity to rebuild and reimagine not just a diplomatic core, which has been hollowed out, but the way we think about this line of work and the word development and development diplomacy where 
this entire spectrum that I'm talking about from the international development community all the way to the foreign policy, national security community, actually reimagine how they're, act, they're, they're part of the same infrastructure and architecture. And they work across these silos collectively on development diplomacy with, with really ambitious goals. I mean, that's the other thing I, I hope the book you know, comes out with, we're not talking about on the margins, trying to make one or two lives better. This, a lot of the work I've worked on and been privileged to work on, we're talking about 80, 90% of, the, of any given country can be affected. Um, in Nepal, for instance, we're working on programming right now that if it goes through, will we'll reduce poverty and, and help the lives of 80% of the population. Right. I mean, these are huge numbers that we are talking about in so many cases, if we're able to see the world in a different way. Atama, I think, can you repeat that? I think you, 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 you blanked out for a second. What percentage of the population will it affect? So just Nepal is one example, and there's many, you know, some of the work that we're working yeah. on right now there on the development side, if, if it goes through successfully, will help reduce poverty for 80% of the country, right? This is a country that has its poverty on par with Afghanistan on many metrics. And so, yeah. you, know, a, you know, even a relatively small investment can pay huge dividends when we think about the things that we care about from a foreign policy perspective. Yeah. So a couple of questions, and then I want, and I want to end with sort of your personal story too in this, because I think it's important for, as people think about their careers. So I'm going to come back to that. Uh, there's a question here, bureaucracies have their own culture and practices and may want to break from that. Even though bureaucracies can help shape culture and bridge the gap between development and foreign policy, how likely is that to happen? Yeah. So... It's, it, you know, here's the thing with that question. So this is true. The inertia to change in any organization for, or any human being, actually, no one wants to change for the sake of change. Actually, that's a very uncomfortable feeling many of us have, actually. And bureaucracies are no different than that. But we know bureaucracies will change and will adapt when they have to. And let me give you a couple examples. So in the book, there are many examples, starting with the introduction in Mongolia, for instance, but then carrying it forward to different countries around the world where we see where we saw this happen, where, um, you know, in the South Asia context, for instance, where we were trying to put together massive transformative deals. And we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that the U.S. ambassador wanted to get through the head of USAID wanted to get through, the head of MCC wanted to get through, the World Bank wanted through, the ADB, the Asian Development Bank wanted it through. Everyone was aligned, right? Everyone was like, this, this makes perfect sense. We could get the funding. Congress was gonna support it. The White House and OMB were gonna support it. We had all our stakeholders on board. And then what happens? We get stuck. We get stuck, mm -hmm. not because we couldn't identify the policy, we did. We get stuck, not because we can't get the funding. Miraculously, we did. We get stuck because at the transactional level, our teams within, whether it's US government, with other multilateral associations, with our embassies, with other governments, don't actually know sometimes how to work together and talk to each other and have never done anything like this at scale before. And so have never trained for it. And you're training in real time and you're learning in real time, which is great for on the job learning, but it's not great for hitting ambitious timelines to get something built in an X amount of time. And so there's many experiences this book talks about where on the spot we had to be, I had to be super creative and say, all right, we're going to put together a new core team with representatives from the US Embassy, USAID, the State Department, MCC to actually work through how we get to yes together and appreciate we have different points of view and we have different legal mandates, but we share enough in common that we can get this through. How do we work with the World Bank, with the Asian Development Bank? And there's stories in here of this, this ambitious massive transmission line, CASA 1000, to get this through in, in four of the hardest countries in the world because of geo and uh, physical security challenges. Right, and, and how we could bring even four countries that had never worked together ever on anything of this scale and magnitude 
don't even trust each other in many cases, and that historical distrust had been the, the common narrative of the day. How do we create incentive systems? How do we bring them together? How do we leverage the power of US diplomacy to create the right incentives to unlock what we all know is that potential? But we often transactionally don't know how to work together to get it done, even if we understand the policy shining light and the objective to how to get it done. And so I always give this career advice to a lot of people, and I know you do a lot of career talks as well, but I'm always struck there's so much, if, if any of you have ever worked for a principal, you know, whether that's all the way from the president down to any of your bosses who are giving a speech, right? And you're the speech writer, or you're the person behind the scenes that has to help put the speech together. You know what I'm talking about. Like you spent hours and weeks and days of your life putting this perfect speech together. I've always been that person that I'll do my part on that. I'm actually more worried about the day this after the speech is delivered. Yep. How do I make it real? Yep. What do I need to do to make the speech real? Because the speech was gorgeous. It was beautiful. I mean, if everything comes true, we're going to have climate change solved. We're going to have women's empowerment solved. We're going to have all these world problems solved. But how do we actually make it happen? And I think that's the focus a lot of a new way of thinking about development diplomacy is how do we empower the next generation, people who are starting careers in, in, in national security, foreign policy, international development at the start of their careers, not where you and I are trying to figure it out you know, on the job, at the start of their careers with the transactional skills to actually think fundamentally differently than how we were traditionally trained. Yeah, that's such a, we'll dig into that a little bit more, but a uh, question here, which I think follows on sort of what you've been talking about here, which is um, what is your formula for successful foreign aid and assistant development projects versus those that are doomed? Like, I, I think you talked a little bit about it in your last answer, but you know, do you have some, some really key things that will doom something if you don't do a few things well? Um, I will. And I want to say, as I'm answering this question, I owe a huge the reason I'm going to answer this way is because I left government for a few years and got to see this point of view from civil society. And I am almost 100% certain had I not done that, I would not answer in this way today. And so I really appreciate also leaving government to see a completely different point of view. And I encourage that also for all of you thinking about your own careers. You know, when I was in civil society, I, I had a chance to work with so many um, and, you know, around seeing what sustainable actually means. We all say the word sustainable. We want sustainable foreign aid as kind of like the success. Um, and that's how we would judge what good impact for dollars and value for money has. But sustainable for who? Sustainable for who? And I think when, when we put, for me, success of our foreign aid efforts is not just advancing, you know, a national security policy, but it's actually in this inclusive way, putting the very people we say we are trying to help, bringing them into the room and into the driver's seat to both challenge us and help us drive what they actually need for their own development and to put them in, the, in that driver's seat. And that, that is the localization agenda in many ways, right? And, um, I think when we do that, we can do this much cheaper. It doesn't actually even cost as much because you can avoid a lot of these large contracts and subcontracting and the entire development contracting mechanism that is like, you know, started up in the beltway. You get the point of view of women who often run these communities and understand what these communities need. And it goes faster because you don't have to do a million consultant studies to understand what people need if you talk to people, you know, and invite them in the room themselves. And I think so for me to answer the efficacy of foreign aid and assistance, it's, it's really, are we improving in tangible ways the very lives of people that we purport to, to help according to them, according to them? And if that's true, I do believe that that in turn improves our own security and well-being, and that it's a win-win for U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, that is um, 
it's a lot of work, but it's totally worth it. And it's important that we do do that. And I think your point about investing in the next generation, just to, to be able to learn differently. So you don't have to unlearn the skills that you've learned, which I've spent a lot of time unlearning things uh, in my career, that it's important to do that. So I have a question here, and then I'm going to, I, I want to really want to focus on you as a, as, as a person. Um, how do you see the role of emerging technologies in development? Uh, is there a space for cryptocurrency for vulnerable populations? Is it too early to talk about technology in the realm of development? I know you think about this a lot because you and I have had this conversation. So I uh, would, would love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, I'm embarrassed answering this question in front of you, to be honest, because you really are the expert <laughs> on these issues. So I would actually welcome you, Sonal, to share your thoughts on this. But I mean, absolutely, the short answer is there's absolutely a critical role for emerging technologies. And um, we would be giving up a huge opportunity to, to think otherwise. I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed, even during the pandemic, for all the challenges the pandemic has laid bare, it's also exposed a lot of technological opportunities. Yeah. Um, and that's everything from even when we talk about inclusivity, even the fact that we can have conversations all around the world now at local levels, village levels, with people that normally we would never even be able to find, or let, let alone visit, to bring in their point of view. I mean, one, just to flatten who gets to participate and how. Um, obviously a role um, for financial access, digital access in ways that technology can enable, particularly for the most vulnerable and marginalized communities. But I also think as governments, and you know, a lot of governments right now are really struggling, particularly lower income and lower middle income countries with staggering levels of debt coming out of this pandemic and rising inflation. I think even giving them, there, there's a window of opportunity even for them to rethink how they can use technology to lower transactional costs of doing business. And uh, really thinking through the kind of the breakthrough technologies that many of us are seeing and actually employing every single day. How do we put that at scale in integrated and coordinated ways uh, for these governments in ways that like actually would have taken us 10, 20, 30 years to do the capacity building for before? Uh, in, in many ways, I, I do think we could leapfrog some of those efforts. We're seeing that along with drone technology, just as an example of a way of collecting data and spatial technology and geospatial mapping in ways that give us so much more knowledge in a shorter amount of time today around the needs of, of vulnerable and marginalized populations, for instance, that otherwise would literally be off the grid for us. And I think there's so many other examples and ways we can be thinking about that. Um, government is not always the innovator in that space, though, and so I want us to be humble about that, and I think that's where these different types of collaborations and partnering differently to really understand the private sector pieces and emerging technologies in the private sector and how, we're, how we in government would have to adapt in order for that collaboration to make any sense. I think that's going to be critical, and so I welcome your views, of course, on that as well. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I know, especially since you're working in Afghanistan and South Asia and, and, and East Asia, it's interesting because, you know, it's funny, in some ways, a lot of the emerging markets in developing countries have picked up technology, like mobile money is much more mobile in other parts of the world than it is in the United States. And, and it's funny that we, we sort of think about technology as, um, you know, payment mechanisms, but when you think about these payment mechanisms in other countries, they're already using them. They're not even, they're not even waiting for the, for the, for the, you know, creating a bank account. They're just like, we can go straight to mobile money. It, it got created in Kenya, for God's sakes. It didn't get created here. What India has done with the, with the universal ID has also changed. I know Afghanistan had started this too. So I think there's a lot that's happening in technology. I think we have to stop thinking about it as how can we help people to say, what is that transformation look like and and how do you leapfrog so there's a, there's this question of we tend to go this linear path as opposed to the leapfrogging path which is what you talked about and and I, I think there's a huge opportunity for technology to do good we just have to we also have to stop this distrust between technology and government and we have to figure out how to use it effectively because it's either a technological conversation or it's an anti-government conversation and you know social media companies are not the only technology, technology players in the world. So we have to think about that. Um, so Fatima, we have about 10 minutes. I wanna use this time a little bit to talk about personal, right? Um, you're a mother of three. Um, how have you managed to do everything that you're doing with three kids um, and 
overcome any challenges that you felt like you were facing? Um, somebody asked this question, it's like, how have you done this? How have you made that happen for yourself? Well, let me just say about my day to day, actually, because <laughs> I think, first of all, I'm on day to day survival, like so many parents and so many caregivers out there. And it's just not easy. And I don't want to paint a romantic picture, actually, that, you know, it's, it's really hard, I think, as as women and men are trying to figure out their own career options, their own personal and family options, whether that's kids or maybe elderly parents, right? I mean, it's not just having kids. It's if you're in any kind of caregiver role, I think it's really hard. And I just wanna be honest and upfront about that. It is really hard. Um, I have an incredible spouse. So I really have to say like he really, um, he has a lot, he has really helped create the env enabling environment for me to be able to pursue this line of work. Um, Pre-pandemic, you know, I was spending when I was in the government before, you know, I think I covered something like 750,000 miles and traveled for the government over 30 plus countries. I think I was on the road like 10 days or so a month on average. Um, so it was just a lot. And I used to joke when I was in the Senate um, and I used to, you know, travel with Senator Kerry to, to, to South and Central Asia quite often he was always like, you're pregnant. And I said, I was always pregnant. Like in some capacity, whether the first, the second, the third, if I wasn't pregnant, I was nursing. If I wasn't nursing, I was taught in the toddler phase of what, whichever kid I was with. So first the book has a lot of personal stories about this um, that really share the ups and downs, maybe way too much information on my personal life than you'd ever want to know or need to know. But I thought it was actually really important to be vulnerable in this space and share with all of you you know, especially for women, especially for those that are trying to kind of balance family responsibilities, it can be really tough. And so the book has a lot of stories, for instance, of having to figure out how to keep my breast milk supply up while being on the road all the time, including in war zones where you just couldn't pump in any kind of safe or sanitary conditions, or even let your principals know you're pumping because let's face it, at the time I was with largely all men, we did not talk about these issues. And I hope that's changed. I hope we are talking about these issues more openly now, but certainly as I was growing up in the system, you did not, and I talk about this in the book, you did not go out of your way to make it known that you had young kids or that you had special needs for yourself as a woman or mother, or, um, you know, I didn't really go out of my way to make it, you know, to be a woman, I guess, in many ways. So you just kind of wanted to blend in and go with the flow. And I work mostly with men, for a good chunk of my career, particularly in the Senate, you know, which is a largely a white male space. And so, you know, you're not trying to, I, I think I spent a lot of time trying to just blend in, not be, not be brown and not be male, right? Or not be female, I should say, in, in many of that. And that was hard because you don't have a, a lot of solidarity and support. Um, as I grew up in the system though, and as I went from a staffer to a principal in my career trajectory, I really tried to turn that on its head in many ways and kind of lean in to challenge the status quo. And it starts with your policies, your organization's policies. I mean, you can have a great boss and that's great, but unless you have a systems approach with the right policies that enabled you know, an environment where you can also be caregivers, right? And again, in whatever capacity you need to do that, we're never gonna to get to that tipping point, right? Whether that's with young kids or elderly parents or anything else going on in your life that is not about your job, which I hope is all of our lives in, 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 in every meaningful way. So for so I think for me personally, it's been, um, you know, I had three kids under five for, for a good chunk of my career and I was in day-to-day -day survival mode and the book shares some, what some of those stories look like. Um, Fast forwarding to today, I think a lot of it is, uh, I just I just did it right before this talk, curry in a hurry. And you know, how can I cook? I've learned to cook super fast. I've learned to multitask ridiculously well, maybe too well actually. And um, really trying to figure out how to get that right balance, um, especially as my kids get older and they don't have as immediate baby needs, but they have more teenage needs and trying to figure out how to also be there for them with that. So. It's doable, we do it, I'm, I'm living proof of that, but I do think it's hard. And I think, you know, support, solidarity and transparency. I think opening up this conversation and being more honest amongst all of us, what it really takes, 
and the exhaustion that so many of us feel at night when we go to bed. Um, these are real problems that I think are across our society, not just for these types of jobs. I actually think this is culturally a bigger problem set in a conversation that is gratefully taking place in this country right now. And I hope we can lean in and really use the pandemic and what we've learned from the pandemic to think differently about opportunities, particularly for women. Um, if, if we want women to go up the ladder, the career ladder in any sector, we're gonna have to have different types of conversations. Absolutely. And I think your point about, um, you know, once you got into a position from being a staffer to, to leadership, making sure you're changing the policies for others around you. So you started to build that, uh, build that um, community so others can also ask for what they need. And I, I do think it's funny, you know, I know I'm older than you and it's so funny because I feel like I was having that conversation, you're having that conversation, the next generation's having that conversation. We have to change the status quo on this. <laughs> and, and we've got to figure out how to make that happen. Last question on you for you. You talk a lot about transformation in the book. You talk a lot about the changes that are taking place in foreign policy and other places. Part of the reason I'm asking this question at the end is what can we all, you know, you're talking to the Truman National Security Group here, which is like, what could they do differently in their career to think about how they can carry on this, what you've been talking about development and diplomacy? What is it? I know it's in your book already. So just talk about it a little bit about, you know, why, where, where people can make a difference today? What can they do? So, you know, I, I think the Truman community has all the right ingredients to help with transformative change for, the net, for building out the architecture, the infrastructure and the language to set up for this, for this next generation. And um, I really urge, and, and maybe um, we can pull up, I have, I have two, I, have two um, I hope they're not too small, but I have two um, graphics here. They're in the book that I wanted to share with Truman here. One is a curriculum. So I actually took a stab at designing a curriculum for that Truman and uh, graduate schools, colleges, Foreign Service Institute, other training institutions can cover and think about around both courses, but also the competencies that I think we really need to think about around development diplomats. And, and I say that, Sonal, because this term doesn't exist today. This term development diplomat does not exist today. Let's be no. very clear. No. It's the title of my book, but that's pretty much it. So um, I think Truman could help create the next generation of development diplomats. And imagine if we were intentional about this. Imagine if we actually invested in a 1,000 person strong army of development diplomats that actually had the technical and tactical competencies to transform the world by breaking poverty at scale, whether that's through economics, it could be through digital, financial, security, there's a cryptocurrency, it could be through health. There's so many different angles to this, um, but imagine if we were intentional about that space. So I wanted to share with Truman a suggested curriculum um, that we could think about that has different kind of core competencies. The other piece that the book has are 21 recommendations. And these are things that, you know, in and of itself, you've seen probably these in many different settings, many different reports. But I wanted to pull together six key areas across 21 different recommendations that I really think we could be intentional around thinking differently around, and that's around money, bureaucracy, politics, language, emotional intelligence, and diversity. And when you actually take all six together and all 21 recommendations together, and the book is actually, I hope you find representative of all of those 21 things in action of what stories, and the book has all these vignettes and, and stories of what this actually looks like in real time, both success and failure, right? It's not because most, most of the stories ended up failing in some way, shape or form. Um, after the fall of Kabul, as you know. Um, when you think about this, I think these are areas for the Truman community to think intentionally around. And as, as, as Truman weighs in around um, building out the, the, the diplomatic corps, for instance, remaking and rethinking diversity and equity, inclusion and access initiatives, these are concrete areas that I hope can help shape the conversation. And I hope we can be intentional around 
once and for all breaking these artificial silos that really do separate us and prevent us, you know, when we're 18 years old, when we're 18, we're already trained to think a certain way, let alone when we're 25 or 40 or beyond. And so I hope these recommendations are helpful to the Truman community as we can think differently around actually investing in development diplomats. So Fatima, I, um, again, I want to do like five more of these book talks with you because then I'm going to learn even more each time. But I really want to thank the Truman National Security Project for hosting this conversation. Um, really want to thank Ginny uh, for everything that she's done in pulling this together um, and Jenna for, for just being such a great leader. But I think what I want the audience to take away from this is to remember that this is a like it is this is the moment if anyone's going to be thinking about how we think about diplomacy differently and how do we think about development dif differently read this book because it is a it is a place for you to think about your career but also how do you think about changing the institutions that you may work in because Fatima has done it whether it's in civil society whether it's in the you know on the congressional side or whether it's on the you know um, executive side and what you can do because we each have the power to make some change happen and this book offers ways to do that so I think there's so much here um, Fatima, I really appreciate your vulnerability about what it felt like to be a mom doing this, to be a woman doing this, what you learned along the way in trying to make the system change, and 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 how to leverage you know champions, but also how do you deal with some of the some of the harder parts? And I, I really appreciate your vulnerability because too often we think of leadership as never having to deal with all of those things, and every day in our daily lives we're like, there's a lot of shit going on. Um, sorry, excuse my language here, um, but I. Do think this is important and what you've done here is so critical so to the team please read this book i mean if you haven't read it i urge you to read it um i've read it twice just because i i needed to reread it to under to remember everything i read the first time and i do think it's important um but thank you for everything you're doing fatima what you continue to do and and thank you for all this great advice so thank you. I really, I really, really appreciate that. And I have to say, I appreciate so much your mentorship along the way. I wanted to actually end with kind of a reflection, if you don't mind, around, you know, oftentimes I, I used to feel like this when I was 25. I wrote this book in many ways because during the COVID pandemic, I stopped traveling, honestly. And all of a sudden I had all this free time and, and actually I didn't know what to do with it beyond investing. You know, I did all the kids stuff. We went hiking. We did all of like the family. We baked bread. We did all of that. And I still felt like I had a story to tell. And I kept thinking about myself, what did I wish I, I knew when I was 25? And how, like, what is it no one told me when I was just starting out my career? And I decided, well, at least I could write it, my version of that down and, and share it with the next generation, which is what I did. But, but the, the truth is, I think, you know, all of us, none of us are an island in this journey. You know, if you want to change the world, if you want to have impact at scale, if you want to be a public servant, if you believe in kind of changing the world for good in your own way, and that could be in government, in private sector, civil society, it could be at the local, national, global levels, you know, in any way that that matters, you're not an island and it's, um, we do it together and it's a community. And Sonal, you've been so instrumental in my part of that community. And I'm really, really grateful for you for the mentorship throughout on this book. I had so many others come in and I wanted to share in a moment of, of, of lightness as we end. Um, my sister, when I published this book, gave me this as a gift and I wanted to share it with you and see. So I'm gonna put you on the spot for a second. Um, it's a cube. I know you can't see it, you can't feel it, but if you can take my word for it, it's, it's, a, it's a cube, it's a you know, rectangle here. And on Beautiful. it, it has different quotes of support from some of the early praise quotes that came in from from different members. Um, but I, and I said to my sister, I said, well, this is amazing. It's, it's gorgeous. I love it. And she says, no, but Fatima, do you know what it is? And I said, yes, it's everything I just said. And she goes, no, no you don't understand what it is. So let me ask you, Sonal, do you know what this is? Is that all the book quotes in the back of your book? Mm -hmm. It's some of them. That's you know them. No. So she said to me, she said, none of us are an island and we often get stuck. And I made this for you to remember that we have to do it together. And this is writer's block. <laughs>
right? And, 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 and I put it on my desk and I share it now in almost all my talks because uh, not only is it a really thoughtful gift, it really is, I think, it is a community together to get us unstuck, to get us unstuck and to attack the writer's block, you know, symbolically together. And I just, I wanted to end on that note with Truman because, you know, if you're part of Truman or if you're listening to this talk in any way, this is a community that when, when, when it comes together, this is the best of who we can be is to think transformatively about what it takes to make change at scale. And I, I really believe in the power of this network for helping us think differently about this concept of development diplomacy. It's a new concept. I hope Sonal, by the time we're having the tail end of these conversations, everyone's like, duh, everyone's talking about development diplomacy. So it's not such an, a thing anymore, but we're starting out on that journey together. So I really appreciate um, doing that with you and my, my tremendous thanks to Jenna and the entire Truman team for hosting us today. Thank you so much. You're amazing, Fatima. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks for being a part of this conversation.